uh, our fabulous Anna Simon is uh, our moderator this morning. And so she's going to be watching the chat and, and uh, getting questions to us that you put in the chat in case uh, Rabbi Citrin and I might miss, miss those. Um, uh, you may also raise your hand using the, the Zoom um, reactions button at the bottom. Uh, so if you want to be called on, you can do it that way. Uh, either way, it's going to work. Um, so those are the rules. Um, I, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Anna, you'll add anything if I missed it. Um, go ahead, Anna. I just want to, hello everybody. Good morning. It's so nice to see everybody in all your boxes. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I put in the chat, so I want to make sure everybody knows how to find that. If you haven't done Zoom, if you're on a laptop, you should see a little thought bubble or talking bubble and you click on the chat and um, we will put notes in there. Someone else, you can put questions there as well. Um, the other thing is, as you notice where um, my box, you can see my name, Anna Simon, on there. Take a look at what yours says. I know sometimes it automatically says, you know, Anna's iPad. We want to know who's here so we can follow up with you because the challenge when we have a Zoom event, if you um, just show up and we, ha we don't have your contact information, we don't have any way of um, following up with you. So please be sure to put your first and last name uh, in the on your bio here if you will and what you do is you take your mouse and you hover over the three little dots uh, it should be a blue square with some dots and if you click on that it says rename and you can you can name yourself whatever you would like us to call you first and last name and that will be uh, easier uh, I also want to make sure everybody knows how to turn on and off um, their video there is a little icon that says it'll either say start or stop video and you can click on that so we can see your lovely faces and um, I will go ahead and turn mine off right now so you may see my name. It, it means I'm still here, um, but you'll see my name there as well. And um, if you want to uh, only look at the speaker, if you want that person to be bigger, there is something that says speaker view or gallery view. And if you click on the little, it looks like a Rubik's cube for gallery view, you'll get more people in um, your sort of area of visibility. And if you only, for instance, want to see the person who's talking, click on speaker view and you can change that throughout. Uh, at some point when we do a screen share, the PowerPoint presentation will take up most of your screen. So sometimes it's harder to see everybody who's around. But when we turn that off, you'll see more of um, everyone's faces. So I think that's all. I'll turn it over to Rabbi Citron and to Heidi. And you, I'll turn off my camera and you can direct me and as to what you need me to do. Thank you so much, Anna. And Rabbi Citron, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, good morning to everyone. And I'll give a second with both Anna and Heidi. Thank you all very much for taking some time to be with us this morning. Um, I, I must say that I spoke to my two older brothers. I have a, a brother who's 82, another 85, and spoke about the polio epidemic and how we remembered it uh, from the 1940s and early 50s. Um, so maybe I'll just ask for a show of hands how many of you, before we turn to this power, this brief PowerPoint that, uh, that, to kind of introduce it, uh, how many of you have personal experience with polio uh, within your family or within your own life? Yeah, I have a fair number. And uh, it's surprising, Phyllis and I have spoken about uh, friends of ours that we know, uh, one of Phyllis's colleague from the St. Paul Talmud Torah, uh, who was afflicted with it, one of our very good friends. So this is, this feels very real. And uh, I must say reading this Philip Roth's final book, he wrote a series of four books. Heidi's going to say a word about Philip Roth after we come back. But Philip, Philip Roth, this is Phyllis, he, uh, he wrote a series of four books with this rubric of Nemesis in which this was the last one. Um, and I hope you found it as um, engaging and as moving and as in in some ways as tragic um, as I did. I read it, I read it uh, and then read it again and it moved me even a second time. So uh, Anna's going to put up a little PowerPoint just to give you a little introduction. I must say I've had a real delight in kind of preparing for this. Uh, Larry, who I can see right there, uh, told me about his son, who's uh, an epidemiologist out at the University of California at San Diego. And we had a lovely conversation preparing for all of this as well. So there's the PowerPoint. Uh, great. Um, uh, and let me just uh, 
say a word about this first slide. And Anna's going to, I just want to invite you if you're interested, Anna can send you the PowerPoint presentation or a PDF. If you get the PowerPoint, uh, you'll actually be taken to other things. So uh, under Philip Ross um, photo that you see right there in the middle, if you click on I'll be seeing you, since the the song plays quite prominently in the book, you'll actually be taken uh, to a, a recording of uh, Billy Holiday singing, I'll be seeing you, quite wonderful. Um, and uh, the, there's actually, and this is true, I didn't make this up. There's a book called The Jews of Lukaki. Um, I don't I don't have the book, but it was kind of part of the Morris County Historical, Jewish Historical Society. Uh, and the executive director of the Historical Society wrote this book, one of three books that she's done uh, on the Jews of Morris County and Essex County and that part of New Jersey. Um, and Philip Roth uh, is obviously one of the most prominent citizens. And, uh, and then we'll, and now we'll move on. So, and we can just, some of you perhaps will remember these posters. I, um, I have a very faint, but a very clear memory of posters and certainly collecting money for the March of Dimes. Uh, if any of you were able to see the video uh, from PBS, there's actually two videos. There's the, there's the one that's done by PBS, which was done in early March of this past year, and I heartily recommend it. And there's one also, done by British TV about four years ago. That's equally powerful, somewhat longer in his presentation. And now we go on to uh, kind of handle, and I think these pictures, um, uh, every time I look at these pictures, I'm kind of blown away. Uh, so some, maybe you've seen some of these pictures, uh, the, the iron lung, uh, the huge iron lung at the bottom, uh, the FDR picture uh, off to the bottom left, uh, which is, um, uh, and FDR plays prominently in the history of the March of Dimes, obviously, uh, and uh, in so many other ways. And then, um, as you'll see, the top left, and then the next slide, um, and uh, as I kind of put these together, I wondered whether uh, we'll have the same headlines uh, when, when the vaccine um, is finally discovered uh, for our current pandemic. Um, I suspect that the headlines will, um, will look much the same um, because the headlines that we're reading now are quite grim. Okay, so I think the next slide um, you'll find, I, I think you'll find interesting. Uh, so some of you have um, maybe seen this. I, I did this once for a sermon at the Adath. So in the year 2000, um, the Jerusalem Quarterly, which was like a kind of a slick Time magazine type from Jerusalem, um, the year before in 1999, in anticipation of the turn of the millennium, they asked their readers to submit their list, their top choices, the, the 100 greatest Jews of the millennium. Um, and this is the list. I know you can't read it. Um, maybe when, if you solicit it, I'd be happy to send you a, a copy myself of it. But if the next slide, so this is, this was, this is the list of 100 uh, done by readers and a pretty big readership then. Um, but if you go to the next slide, you'll see why I was particularly interested. So this is on the left, the top 10 uh, in, the, in the chosen by the Jews. And take a look at number nine which I think is actually just astounding, that of the greatest Jews of the millennium, Jonas Salk is identified as number nine, and 51 on your right-hand side uh, is Albert Sabin, and as the movie uh, that I recommended from PBS shows, there was great competition between Salk and Sabin, uh, and an early disaster with the Salk vaccine um, gave Albert Sabin some um, opportunity to do uh, a kind of um, a kind of I told you so a routine. So Albert Sabin number fifty one and number seventy um, at the very bottom of the list, as it just turns out conveniently, is Philip Roth. Uh, I'll say just one last thing. Uh, I've I've often used this list, um, especially when I taught up at St. John's and at Mac. Um, 
and I would always say to students, so um, uh, who are you most surprised when you find on this list? Uh, and inevitably, many people would say, 48. What's number 48 doing on the list? Um, and maybe at some time we'll, we can talk about who, why number 48 is on the list. But it's a quite interesting decision by people who wrote into the, and lots of, lots of thousands of people wrote into the Jerusalem Quarterly. Uh, they have a very funny introduction to this, which you can see uh, in the original list. Okay, so let's go on now. Uh, and uh, with a little bit of uh, study, um, this was for me eye-opening uh, to see. Um, and that is take a look at Minnesota. And the only place that comes close to Minnesota uh, in terms of the number of cases in 1910 is Pennsylvania. Um, and it's interesting that Pennsylvania and the Sister Kenny Institute in Philadelphia, which uh, uh, Philip Roth mentions in the book is right there. Uh, so this is a very interesting historical gr uh, kind of map of what, uh, and you'll see in the next slide, I think it's the next slide, um, kind of what um, what polio looked like, the up and down, the way in which, uh, you know, about the same, about the same year, the famous influenza of the last part of the second decade of the 20th century, uh, 1918, I guess that is. Um, and then you in, were particularly interested in the 1945 and you can see the numbers beginning to grow dramatically uh, immediately after the second world war, um, 1945 and on. Um, um, uh, and I thank Carol Birdie. I'm not going to try even we cut. So uh, I ought to ask Carol, unmute yourself and re say the uh, correct <laughs> pronunciation for us. <laughs> Carol? <laughs> okay. Um, so let's go on. The next slide uh, simply shows what dramatically happens after 1955. Um, and then uh, after the introduction of the Sabin vaccine, much easier to administer and uh, um, much less expensive and doesn't require um, the kind of uh, all the paraphernalia. Um, and you can see what happens to, to polio. So that's an unbelievably dramatic. Um, but there are, as, you'll, as I'll say just a word, there are some issues. So let's go to the next one. For, um, so this is just a timeline. Again, you can request this. Uh, I, I don't want to take a lot of time on this. I just, I think this is just interesting for a couple different reasons. So if you'll take a look at the very first citation, 1908. So Carl Landsteiner and Erwin Popper received the Nobel Prize in 1930 for their discovery at the last part of the 19th century of blood types. They are the discoverers of A, A, B, and O, and B. I mean, they, they I, for which, as I said, they received the Nobel Prize in 1930. And in 1908, they do amazing work throughout their careers. Carl Landsteiner ends up at the Rockefeller Institute in New York, as you'll see in just a minute. Uh, Carl Landsteiner, um, is the first person to identify, um, uh, along with Erwin Popper, um, through feces, which of course plays some prominence in Nemesis, they discover how the disease is transmitted. This is the first discovery that will ultimately lead to the Salk discovery uh, and the, uh, the, the kind of the live and, and dead vaccine types. Um, so, um, Night, this is 1908, uh, but Carl Landsteiner is, is, well, I'll take, I'll say just a word about Carl Landsteiner. I do want to point out that in 1935, test a polio, there's a, there's an early, uh, an earlier polio vaccine with disastrous results. So this is working on for a very long time. And then there's Jonas Salk who begins in 1947. And the stories of his work and his students and how they begin their work is actually a quite amazing story, as that video uh, says. Um, and the only other one I just want to say a point, word about, because it has a Minnesota connection, is 1940 and Sister Kenny, uh, about whom I'll say a word in, 
just a moment as well. So just a word about Carl Landsteiner. And again, uh, I, I urge you to, if you're interested to f follow up th because this has in its own interesting way, so a remarkable connection uh, to Philip Ross later writings um, uh, and to Nemesis. So the, as the next slide shows you, so here's Carl Landsteiner. Um, and it says, revolution medicine went in 19001. He identified three major human types, A, B, and O. Uh, and it, as you see, he does the RH factor at the end of his life. And he's, a, a, and he's awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, then the, the, the citation about polio. But what's so interesting about Carl Landsteiner and Heidi, and I think Ann and I, we, we had a discussion about this. Uh, I, in a completely different context, um, one of the things that I discovered by Carl Landsteiner is verified in the following quite remarkable private archive that you'll see on the next slide, about which I'll say just a word. So as you can see, what you are looking at is the confidential memorandum um, issued by the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, which is still in existence today, the JTA, in 1937, a book publisher was going to do a book called Who's Who in American Jury, and they included Carl Landsteiner. Uh, and they, uh, they sent out asking him for some biographical information, saying that they intended to include him in this book. And he sued to have his name removed because he had, con he had been born into a Jewish family uh, in Austria, and then converted to Catholicism at the end of the 19th century, and did not identify further as a Jew. Uh, and after he sued, uh, he was asked by the JTA for an interview, and he agreed to the interview. Um, I'll urge you to read it on your own. I don't want to take time this morning. It's an enormously painful interview which he has in which he talks about why he doesn't want to be identified as a Jew, why he fears for his family's life being identified as a Jew, why he wished there wasn't a book identifying Jews. So in the sense of what not only his personal life, but what anti-Semitism and the 1930s meant in America, this is a, an amazingly revealing document. And perhaps we'll have a chance for you to take to look at it. Anna can put it up again if you'd like to have a conversation about it, but it's a really fascinating document. Okay. And, um, you know, you can, uh, you can click on further information about Sister Kenny. Uh, I can remember the first year I went here and I, I, I arrived in Minneapolis and would go to the Abbott Northwestern and the Sister Kenny Institute. And I said, hmm, that's funny, a, 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 a Catholic, a Catholic nun, um, and, and there's a there's a place named for her. But of course, she wasn't a nun; she wasn't Catholic, uh, as I was later to love her, to discover. And there is Sister Kenny, and there is Rosalind Russell playing Sister Kenny uh, in a 1946 movie, um, and uh, a kind of a stitch. And uh, that that picture of her, you'll see, I think, in the next slide. Yep, it's, that's the next slide. So if you, I don't think we can zoom in, but you can see that it's called the Elizabeth Kenny Institute. Um, and um, I think you can see her immediately under the banner, right in the middle, kind of by the microphone. It's a little hard, yep, that's Sister Kenny, <laughs> okay? At the, the dedication of the Elizabeth Kenny Institute, she initially came out to the Mayo Clinic uh, because the the, the doctors in New York said, oh, no, 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 that's not the way to do things. You can't, you know, those New York doctors, they know everything. Uh, and so she came out to, uh, to first to the Mayo Clinic and then in 1940 and then came to Minneapolis in 1942 with her method uh, for rehabilitating polio victims. Okay. Um, and I just thought I found this, I found this a quite dramatic uh, graph. And I just have to say that I think uh, um, the just showing this graph and what this has meant for our children's lives and our grandchildren's lives and all of the fear um, 
about when are we going to have a vaccine and is the vaccine going to work and what are the dangers with the vaccine is pretty, pretty complicated to say the least. Um, and the anti-vaccine movement, and there's a, there's a lot to, to see just contemplating this, uh, this particular graph. Uh, and just these slides, which I, I won't belabor, they simply show the kind of the disappearance of vaccine across the world. Um, again, you can you can take a look at these if you request uh, the, the graph from uh, Anna. So the next couple of show that there, there's this one, and you can see how it's disappearing. And the only three places where there is active polio today are those dark red: um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. Um, that's where there are still present cases today. I mean, along with, I mean, where they're endemic. Okay, I think, um, uh, and so if you, again, if you request, uh, not the PDF, but the PowerPoint presentation, if you would click on the American experience, the polio crusade, you would actually be taken to uh, the PBS special. I think that's all we're gonna do for now before we send you to our breakout rooms. All right, everyone, thank you. And thank you, Rabbi Citrin, for that amazing background on polio. And um, so I'm, we're going to send you now, I, rather, Anna's going to send you now into breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to give you 10 minutes to chat with one another. And the re my request is that you come up with, um, find a reporter who will raise their hand and we will call on them to report back. We'd like to have questions. Uh, that, uh, that you have about the book that you would like to discuss uh, as a group and uh, topics that you think are um, important in the book that you wanna talk about. Um, so off you go, enjoy, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Have good discussions on this amazing book. Uh, is everybody back, Anna, do we know? <laughs> hello, hello, I see, I see many of you, well, nice to have you back. Um, so I wanna give a little introduction about um, Philip Roth, and then I'm going to, um, we'll open it up for uh, reporters to, uh, to talk. So reporters, if you would go down to the reaction button at the bottom of your screen, in my screen, it's on the far right. Um, and if you press that, you have two choices, thumbs up and ha clapping hand, use either one, I don't care. Uh, we will call on you, unmute you, and you can talk to us about what topics you want us to focus on and uh, what questions you have. So a little about Philip Roth. Um, this, as Rabbi Citrin said, was the last of 31 books that he wrote. And Philip Roth indicated that this was going to be his final book when he, when he wrote it. He died in 2018 at the age of 85. What an amazing career he had. Um, uh, he, uh, he has been, he was, he was, there are so many awards, I can't count them, but uh, he was awarded nationally and, and internationally awards, um, including Lifetime Achievement Awards. Uh, for his body of work, including the Library of Congress Creative Achievement Award in 2012. And he was still writing after that. Uh, someone asked, what were the nemesis books? And, and the four nemesis books were Everyman, Indignation, The Humbling, and Nemesis, the last one of the nemesis books. Uh, we read Everyman, in the Adath Book Club in uh, 2019. So those of us who read Every Man know that the theme of the Nemesis books is mortality and the struggle to stay alive. So this is, this is his final take on this question of mortality. And I also just wanna add that Nemesis, maybe some of you look this up, uh, is the Greek goddess of vengeance and retribution. She carries out justice and she roots out hubris or pride. So it's really interesting to me that these four series of books he calls the nemesis books because I guess it causes us to think about, you know, what is the pride of the main character? What is the, what is the need for retribution? All right, enough about our introduction to uh, Philip Roth. I'd love to see hands um, so that we can call on you reporters from each group and tell us what you were thinking about.
Heidi, I'm going to jump in. I just want to let everybody know we made it so you now should be able to unmute yourself if Heidi calls on you. And if you're on a laptop, it just is pressing the space bar. And then when you're done talking, you can mute yourself again so we don't hear the background noise. I saw you, Becca. So uh, you can start us off. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll try to summarize what we talked about. We had a lot of uh, people brought up good different points. Um, can you hear me? Beautifully. Okay, so one question that came up was why did Bucky withdraw from life after he had polio and, you know, um, made such an extreme change in his life? Um, we talked about how he was always wrestling with God and a big theme of the story was kind of who to blame for polio. Was it God? Was it different people? Um, and Bucky eventually kind of took all the blame on himself and felt that he was responsible. So maybe that was why he withdrew from life. We talked about Horace and is there a connection between him and the Roman poet, or I hope I'm getting this right, the ancient Roman poet also named Horace. And we, some people thought Horace represents imperfection or he represents what Bucky and others feared becoming as kind of this person who was so flawed or so, um, you know, ill. And then um, we talked about how the characters, a lot of the characters seemed like very perfect people and they had no flaws. And why did Philip Roth do that? And at least one person felt like she didn't connect to the book as much because of that, because the characters were kind of hard to relate to. Thanks, Becca. Thank I, do you. I see another hand? Uh, Marilyn. Okay, so um, as you covered, Heidi, the title of the book, we uh, discussed that and we talked about how it related to Greek tragedy um, and the greatest tragedy of them all is probably Oedipus. And so Bucky doesn't see very well literally, but you know, he's blind to other things. And then when he comes to maybe towards the end, believe that he was the source of um, spreading the uh, polio up at camp, you know, just terrible vision for um, what lies ahead or his life and so, or what could be. So that was, and other subjects, but that was um, what we had more in-depth conversation about. Terrific. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Bonnie, Bonnie. <clears throat> okay. Um, we talked about the ending, that, that beautiful scene with the perfect javelin throw, where everything just came together in perfection so beautifully. And after such a terribly dark uh, portion of the book, uh, talking about Bucky's life as an adult and all of the ways that he denied himself happiness, so the possibility of happiness. And then to end with that perfect javelin throw, um, we, we were very taken by that and not maybe 100% sure why his life had to be so dark in the, in the context of the book. And then what was the reason for this tremendous contrast with that beautiful ending scene? Um, and we related it a little bit to Every Man, which also was very dark and uh, talking more about old age and uh, some of the, the sacrifices, compromises, losses, and so on of old age. Um, we, let's see, what did I write here? Um, that we talked about Arnie, the narrator, and um, whether he was who he was in order to establish a contrast to Bucky, where he also suffered from polio, but he did not go down Bucky's path. He was able to pull through and lead a good life and have a family. So his choices were different, which led us to wonder what made Bucky the way he was. Uh, because Roth gives us his backstory, the loss of his parents, one by death and one by abandonment, um, and the you know, raised, being raised by his grandparents. Was he 
so highly pr principled, almost cripplingly highly principled <clears throat> because of something in his backstory or just, was that just a, simply the way he, the kind of person that he was? And we too talked about the theme of blindness and um, a lot of what Marilyn said, but also that uh, he was blind to Marsha when she came and, and uh, opened herself up to him and he, he just refused to believe that a life with him could be a fulfilling life for her. So those were, I think, some of the main themes that we talked about. Thanks, Bonnie. Do I see another hand? No other groups? Sharon. 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 Oh, I see uh, Rachel. Myself. Well, uh, uh, Diane had trouble with her unmuting, but I just wanted to throw out the idea about the weight of guilt that the, the tremendous guilt that Bucky had uh, for uh, just simply destroyed him. He could not bring himself to lead a normal life with the weight of what he had done. And uh, how, how could he have come out from that uh, terrible darkness? Uh, I, I wish I had known. I mean, it, it was a uh, anger against God, anger against the world, anger against everyone, and most of all, anger against himself. Uh, and that's why I, I wanted to co just comment about, to Bonnie about that last scene. That last scene just had the hope, the hope of how things were once and that uh, to return to that time of purity and love, uh, that there was still some hope at the end. That was kind of my feeling. And of course, the javelin tied in with the Indian lore and also the, the, the shooting of the arrow in a way of disease uh, that uh, the javelin just seemed to have a, a symbolic meaning there. But I liked the ending uh, and uh, it truly was tragic. He was so prescient about seeing what was going on today. People with the fear and, and the, the lack of enough iron lungs and not knowing what caused the, the virus. Uh, there was just uh, I thought a great contemporary feeling about this book. I'm glad that it was suggested. Wow, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, Mort Kane. <clears throat> Hear me now? Yeah, my question oftentimes is, what do we learn? Um, it's a fascinating story with all kinds of uh, um, interesting symbols, et cetera, et cetera. But um, when we come away from this or any other cultural or other experience, uh, how are we enlightened? How does that guide us going forward? And uh, it, part of that, um, I was wondering whether Barry chose this particular piece of literature because of our current pandemic and how our response to that might relate to responses uh, to the polio epidemic of the time. Uh, how, what we, insights we might gain might be applied to our lives now and what's going forward, the uncertainty of going forward, the lack of a vaccine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Mort. Do I see another mm -hmm. hand? Shit. Um, Diane. Diane Mackey. <laughs> Diane, we you may want to put your um, this is Anna your comments in the chat because it looks like for some reason we can't hear you and then we can read them um, once they go in the chat. That's a great idea, Anna. Sorry is there somebody that. else I'm missing who had their hand up? Yeah, I think Sharon's Sharon Weidbaum has her hand. Sharon, great, go ahead. 
Okay. <laughs> Not too good at this here. Uh, You're doing great. Don't okay. apologize. Can you, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay, well, um, Marcy Harris and I discussed several themes, and the idea of guilt was really um, predominant for me, and she agreed. I um, noticed other things, and nobody that I could hear mentioned of the existence of God and Bucky's denying God, and there were a number of characters including Marsha, whose ideas contrasted with Bucky. He, he's questioning God. Why would God do this? Um, where is God? And Marsha, his lady friend, is a believer in God. And there were um, several contrasts and characters throughout the book. I, I love the detail orientation of Philip Roth and his writing, giving you ideas of weather and climates and breezes and stifling humidity and all these things. <laughs> but the contrast of characters, including not only the fiance and Bucky, but at the end, the architect who was a victim of polio, he had a successful and he contrasts with Bucky who wrenched himself into depression because of it. I mean, those contrasts stood out for us. And so, but I think the whole idea of questioning where God is is so universal and has been for centuries and um, can be raised in the present pandemic as well. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Yes, Anna. So I just want to read the comments that Diane um, put in the, the chat so that we can share. And Diane, I'm so sorry, your microphone's not working. Uh, Diane says, Horace, uh, could he represent polio itself? He is silent. He goes to the field and stays a foot away from others and would, quote, remain there without moving, unquote. Could he be the virus hovering? So I just want to let that sit in with everyone. This is Scott. I'm going to talk briefly from our group. Can you hear me okay? Thanks. Thanks for just jumping in, Scott. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I was with Mitch and, um, and uh, Beth, and we were talking a little bit. Um, Mitch talked about a um, uh, family issue with a, a sibling who had Down syndrome and, and the concept of, um, and I talked about my own father who had polio at the age of nine and it affected him for the rest of his life with his legs and feet. Um, and, and how people tr are, have, have been treated, you know, certainly not just the decades, but the centuries of being different. And, and Mitch alluded a little bit to the uh, you know, mention of leprosy in the Torah and people being outcast and living outside the community. And how is it that we have managed um, over the years to, uh, over, the, over the centuries, to treat people who are different than us, whether it's their skin color or their physical affectations or whatever, um, so poorly? And, you know, and then fortunately, um, and I know Mitch related to me in a previous time about how his mother was a real tiger in, in, in advocating for his sister, how fortunately in, in, in the United States at least, people have um, started treating people who are different than us. You know, certainly physical disabilities better um, because of the advocacy and other, th and other things. You know, we mentioned the movie My Left Foot, talked about, I mentioned Stephen Hawking, you know, people who basically have shells for bodies, but there's brilliance inside and how we've come to appreciate that so much better than we have historically. And, you know, and, 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 and relating that to the current pandemic of what's going on and, and the fear. And uh, I, I read the book with a very different view than I would have if I'd read it a year ago, obviously. I'm sure we all would have given them what's going on. All right. Did we get all the comments? I don't want to miss anybody. Um, Heidi? Varsha, go ahead. I think the issue of blame and also somebody being different um, uh, comes up a lot here. Yes, we know that Bucky did perhaps blame himself for the spread of the virus, but in the questions, whoever came up with them, uh, maybe Rabbi Citron, what was the role of Horace or perhaps the Italians Horace 
was perhaps someone that they could look to. He was different to blame for, for bringing this, for, uh, for being a carrier of the virus. Or the Italians who came onto the playground said, we're going to bring it to you Jews. So uh, there was an issue of, well, could they blame these people? We have that today with this pandemic. Did it come from the Chinese, right? So somebody who's different, looking for someone to blame. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Marcia. Any other comments? If not, I think I'm going to, uh, uh, are there any other comments? Just please speak up. Uh, yes, Mark, Gail? My video, video, unmute. Um, sorry, video. Let's go down. No, 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 Mark. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I can hear it. Okay. So I didn't read the book. I read The Plot Against America, and I started worrying about everything going on with Trump. But that I just read <laughs> two months ago. But I didn't read Nemesis. But um, in 1952, and you were talking earlier about fear, um, and I can only relate that in 1952, in the summer, you were, I had you were uh, 10 years old. I was 10 years old. I had polio. Um, I was attending um, a um, Cub Scout camp day camp at our playground at Willard Elementary School in North Minneapolis that was run by uh, the, the Bethel's uh, Cub Scout group. And um, the camp closed immediately as I was diagnosed. And as far as I know, nobody else had it, but there was a great amount of fear in those years about not going to swimming pools and not going to beaches and so forth. And <clears throat> When I was diagnosed, um, I was really fearful because I was admitted to General Hospital because of the number of cases in the city. And I really thought I was not going to, I thought I was going to die. And I saw um, one young person die the first night I was in the hospital. And then oh, somebody my took my comic books and I couldn't see my parents for two weeks. And all that really kind of pervaded this fear thing of, you know, was I even going to make it? And um, I am really a very lucky person. Um, I had physical therapy for a number of years at Sister Kenny afterwards, but I, I've done very well. And then had, had the, the privilege, I would say, of taking care of post-polio patients even up to 30 years later, who had been on respirators ever since 1952, where they got into trouble with their lungs. I ended up doing tracheotomies on them and you know, trying to help them survive at that long distance time. And I'd been running around doing all the things that young kids do after I went back to school late. And they had been on a respirator for 30 years after, after that. And uh, I feel how lucky I was. And it created um, one of the other things that happened is I know the vaccine was a, a, a godsend that came out in 56 uh, with Salk. And initially it wasn't the, the vaccine. There were some problems with it and they had to recall a bunch of it. But now when I see uh, families not wanting to immunize um, their children for various fears, which are understandable to at some level, I just feel it's criminal for uh, parents to keep that from their kids and therefore protect other kids in their schools and so forth. Uh, fear was a really big issue back at that time for me and I think for the community. No one else at uh, the Bethel Cub Scout day camp got sick, fortunately, and you know, where it came from for me, I don't know. But there were 1,500 cases in Minneapolis that summer. So it was somewhat of an epidemic, um, a bad year. And so um, I did not read Nemesis, I will. I didn't even know that Philip had written another book after The Plot Against America. So um, so I, I'm, I'm sort of jumping in without having participated in the earlier discussion. It's just a personal feeling that I had, that I was uh, very fortunate. And then I saw victims 
30 year, up to 30 years later, who had been living with the consequences of um, their disease. So, Mark, I want to thank you for sharing a powerful personal story. Um, really deeply, deeply meaningful. And uh, I see a note from Diane uh, in the chat saying that she couldn't go to the state fair because of polio. I was terribly afraid of ending up in an iron lung. Um, I, at this point, we have about a half an hour to go. So I want to turn it over to um, uh, Rabbi Citron. And, and the three big the three big topics I see, and Rabbi Citrin, you choose your favorite, but the three big topics I am hearing are um, uh, kind of the idea of uh, faith, faith and mortality, this idea of guilt and how one deals with guilt, uh, especially when one is questioning the presence of God in one's life. Uh, second topic is health or polio and how this relates to the experiences we are sharing today. I would include a, a, a discussion of Horus, a question you actually raised yourself, Rabbi, what is the role of Horus in this story? And um, the, uh, the third topic I saw was, um, well, I guess maybe those are the two biggies I see. Um, let's let's go with, you can choose. What, where do you want to start, uh, Rabbi uh, Citrin? So, Anna, I'm going to ask you, um, if, if you don't mind, uh, to maybe flip, to maybe go back to the share screen uh, and to the PowerPoint just to get to, so these were the questions um, that some of you have made reference to. Uh, and, um, yeah, I'd love to hear your your response to the questions. Is well, they as I thought about them and in, in kind of drafting them for you to read as you read through it, um, it certainly very much felt to me, I must say, yeah. um, that that the last one uh, that there were pieces about this story that so resonated. I had not read the book until Phyllis said to me, "Barry, have you read Nemesis?" and uh, uh, I started reading it and it began to click in all kinds of ways, including the fear piece, the scapegoating piece that many of you have spoken about and scapegoating uh, in a variety of different ways does figure uh, in the book. Um, uh, and uh, as I think the next slide, I think if I'm remembering correctly, the next slide talks about just this piece, the scapegoating is not only the Italians, uh, um, who are scapegoated in the book, uh, and Horace, who's scapegoated in the book, uh, but also these three particular citations. I'd love to hear people's responses to these particular uh, ones. Uh, one of the things that I think is so interesting about this novel is the way plague of all kinds hovers over the entire book. Uh, we haven't spoken at all. Um, but now we see this in these particular questions, the way in which uh, Philip Roth um, uh, is addressing not only the plague of polio, but the plague of uh, the Holocaust without even mentioning it, the Second World War. I mean, that first citation, um, and here's a, here's a really interesting piece in, I'm forgetting the year now, but Commentary Magazine decades ago in the early, I guess maybe this must have been in the mid 50s, asked a, a group of Jewish intellectuals, as they identify them, and Philip Roth was one of them, to respond to a series of questions about their Jewishness. Philip Roth is, again, this is the 1950s before the Holocaust is actually discovered, uh, as it is, as it were, uh, with the Eichmann trial. Philip Roth is one of the few individuals responding to that who mentions the issue of the, of not the Holocaust, he doesn't use that word, of course, because that word isn't used yet. Um, but he talks about the, the slaughter in Europe and what happened to the Jews. He's one of the few who mentions that in the early 50s. Um, and the ways in which that seems to be hovering over this book as it, as it did over the plot against America. So to put in the, in the mouth of Marsh's father, I'm against the frightening of Jewish kids. That was Europe. That's why Jews fled. This is America. 
the less fear, the better. Fear unmans us, fear degrades us. Fostering less fear, that's your job and mine. I just wanna say two things. Um, as, as, as Phyllis and I talked about this, the story of Landsteiner and the fear he must have felt, uh, as you'll see when you perhaps read the entire memorandum from the JTA, he feared that his son, who was then a student at Harvard, upon learning about a, his Jewish grandfather and Jewish grandmother would commit suicide. Uh, so that kind of fear, and just a personal story that maybe some of you have heard from, from me, and that is my, sec my middle brother, Ashley, was, his real name is Asher, Asher, A-S-H-E-R. And when my mother took my brother at the age of th whatever the three, the first checkup, the age of three months, and took him to the doctor, it was a Jewish doctor, uh, and the doctor said, what's his name? And my mother said, his name is Usher, because she was pronouncing it with a kind of Yiddish uh, kind, of, uh, kind of nuance to it. His name is Usher, named for, named for our grandfather. And the doctor looked at my mother and said, what? Mrs. Citrin, this is America. You can't name your child Usher. And my mother petrified said, well, what, what should I do, doctor? And he said, well, let me think, you know, there's a movie playing down the street and the hero of the movie is named Captain Ashley. And my mother, my mother uh, changes his name to Ashley from Usher. Uh, so the fear that we've, that, that several of you have spoken about um, and this now, this fear of being a Jew is a quite remarkable piece. And Philip Roth, I think is, is is kind of getting it in these three citations. Um, let me just, uh, I think the, the issue of faith, uh, which really is so powerful towards the end of this book in the conversation between Arnie um, uh, and, you know, kind of the, un the unraveling uh, as Arnie, as, as, as the narrator uh, begins to, to talk about it. So let's go maybe to the next, slide just for a moment. Yeah, so this is, uh, I, 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 I don't have to read it for you. You can, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite extraordinary, and I would say a beautiful, typical piece of brilliant Philip Roth writing. Um, uh, so, so remarkable. Um, uh, and um, uh, I think, raising for us. And then the next, the next slide, which I think really gets uh, at it. Um, so um, Bucky's inability uh, to accept chance and his uh, insistence on blaming himself. And so we've spoken about the, 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 the kind of way in which guilt just is so pervasive throughout uh, the last half of the book. Um, and then this next citation, which I think gets it to it in, the, in kind of in the, in the next page. So he can't, Bucky can't accept chance or contingency. And he is insistent, as you'll see in the next slide, um, in this quite um, brilliant piece. Um, he has to find a necessity for what happens. There's an epidemic and he needs a reason. Uh, that, that it's pointless, contingent, preposterous, and tragic will not satisfy him. And I will just point out, um, those of you who've read uh, Harold, Rabbi Harold Kushner's When Bad Things Happen to Good People know that um, he emphasizes over and again, uh, seeking to remove guilt and shame and responsibility on a certain level from the sheer contingency of life. And it's a contingency or chance is a very big piece of Harold Kushner's theology. Um, and I hear um, uh, the way in which uh, I think many readers of the book point uh, to this piece, um, uh, the way he has to convert, Bucky has to convert tragedy uh, into guilt. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, I think, I, I will leave you to think, I'd love to hear your responses to the things about theology. I would like to come, uh, I don't know how much time we have left, but I would like to come to the final scene, 
that that final scene is quite remarkable and maybe maybe we'll just look at that final kind of a question about that final scene which i think is on the next slide a and then um, the, um, yeah let's see maybe so the, if you can slide kind of slide it up just a bit anna so we can see the last piece of it um uh, uh, well let's see yeah so let me read it to you um uh, arnie's most important role in the novel so here arnie uh who has polio and is able to build a life and have a quite productive career um as an architect uh and then you know, meets again with Bucky and they have this incredible series of conversations as the novel winds up. And um, Arnie's most important role in the novel is to be the auditor whom he had never known as an adult. Um, uh, Bucky had never known as an adult. The auditor, Arnie, now inspiring Bucky's confidence the way as kids, I and the others had been inspired by him. And so I just want to ask this question and to kind of turn to all of you to jump in now. I guess the final question that occurred to me as I thought about it. So does it mean um, uh, that at, even at the cost of his own faith, Bucky um, has passed the moral touch onwards uh, and kind of uh, to Arnie, uh, uh, despite his own belief in the good, I, I guess the, so the, que the, the final question that I asked is, uh, is there a reason for some final optimism uh, in this book and maybe in all of Roth's writings that his, the last scene that he paints for us, uh, I saw that someone uh, had correctly said, is this a piece of nostalgia, which it feels like it is, of course. But is there a reason for hope and optimism? And uh, your thoughts about how uh, how the book ends uh, with these e extraordinarily powerful scenes. So maybe could we get people to kind of jump in now and respond in one way or the other to the, all of these questions? Um. I would like to call on uh, Kathy Fairchild because Kathy, you had put a note um, in the chat and it just seems to be a response actually to the question, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me to be a, a response to what Rabbi Citroen has just posed. So I'm wondering if you could lead off, um, could lead off with your, with your comment. Well, I am. Um, I saw, I saw Arnie having this vision that he found hopeful that that he preserved this memory of Bucky as someone who was, who was beautiful and, and who showed the boys something about athleticism and determination. And um, so from Arnie's perspective, I do think it was a positive thing. But as the reader, um, for me, it was so bittersweet. It was so, it had so much bitterness in it. There was that irony of this is what Bucky had been and what he had been capable of and all of it was lost. And it wasn't just the physicality that was lost, but it was his capacity to teach, his capacity to um, serve as, a, as an example, his capacity to love and care for others, um, his capacity to form relationships. I mean, all of those things had been so vital and, and important in him and passing through the crucible of polio, he, he lost all of it. And so what he, contrasting what he was to what he is at the end of the book and going back to what he was, it just was painful. I found it painful. Joan, uh, Joan, you had something you wanted to add. And I saw that Lisa Bromer had written a chat. Maybe Lisa? Uh, yeah. Might you be willing to kind of elaborate on your very powerful comment in your chat just now? Well, I think there's no possibility for the human condition without the sense of hope and optimism. I mean, in biology, it's change 
or die. Uh, and even if you're physically, you know, say an inmate in a concentration camp and, you know, you don't have control over your diet or your work or whether you'll live or die, your mind is free. Um, it makes me think of Mandela, you know, on Robben Island. And um, you always have the possibility of sending thoughts, intentions, your mind out into the world and demanding change. And it may not come in your physical lifetime because who am I? I'm just a being. I'm just a biological fact in this brief moment in time. But, um, you know, George Floyd is sort of a point in case. Uh, you know, we can't save George Floyd, sad as that is but we can all pull together and create actual change, even if it takes a long time. You know what I mean? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Joan, I have unmuted you if you want to speak. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I don't think hope and optimism are words that I would use for Philip Roth. <laughs> I think it's more about, because I don't think he ever is, but I, I do agree with, um, Lisa, who talked about agency. And I think that what Philip Roth is interested in is the choices that people make and why they make those choices and that there are different choices and issues of responsibility and blame. It kind of reminds me in some ways of existentialism, existentialist questions. And I think that Philip Roth poses these questions but doesn't really answer them. And I think that's true in all of his books. I mean, in American Pastoral, it's like, what are, the, what are the consequences of assimilation? So I think he raises these questions, but doesn't provide any answers. But I would never say he's about hope. <laughs> <laughs> Marcy Harris, you have a comment. Would you like to add it? Well, actually, my, my next comment was, um, Joan was stating much more artfully um, what I was getting at, and maybe, and that was my question, is that it really was, and maybe that was the question I was trying to ask, is what Bill Broth was saying is that there's always choices. And, and, and really, Bucky is making just choices at almost every step of the way that are, are, are absolutely life-changing in terms of how he deals with polio, with the girlfriend, and with God. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think that's the other thing that um, Roth points out. But I would, I would, I would add uh, Mort, Mort Kane's question is, what do we learn from a character like Bucky? Uh, what is it that we, what is it that we possibly can take away? What, what made him the man that he was? Um, I just throw the question out. I, I, I think Joyce Orbach had, a, her, had her hand yeah. raised. <laughs> She's waving for me. Good. But, uh, I, I think that uh, when we think that God prevents bad things from happening to us or uh, causes good things to happen to us, we're always very disappointed because that isn't the way life, how life turns out. And I think my feeling is that God and religion and our friends and our family help us deal with things that happen to us in life rather than prevent things from happening. But they, and that's one thing that Bucky gives up. He gives up all his friends, his religion, and he doesn't deal with his situation very well from my way of looking at it. And that's, I think all of us, uh, potentially could do the same thing and that's not the right thing to do to isolate yourself to blame ourselves to not help have our friends and our religious beliefs give us a support system that's my reaction thank you for that mark have we lost people uh I don't know if I've seen any other hands. Okay. Am I missing a hand? Uh, 
So well, I would I just, ask the question. Just, oh, oh, no, go ahead. Who was thanks. it? I, I'm missing Lisa. you. Lisa, go ahead. I just think that, like, there's a fallacy when we read into any character in literature that they should somehow represent something larger than what they are which is a character in literature and a person with their own personal background and psychology and um, influences growing up. And you can bounce off any particular individual character, but you can't really ask them to represent more than who or what they are which is, you know, one piece in the larger puzzle of a novel or a discourse or, you know, a, a philosophy. So, you know, I just, I just caution against putting too much weight on Bucky himself because the whole thing is a, a piece, you know what I mean? Thanks, Lisa. So Ella Meyerson, do you want to elaborate on the point that you made in the chat? Um, well, um, yeah, I guess not really. I pretty much said it. Uh, um, he, um, had, uh, these wonderful opportunities and you can see people's biases or prejudices and difficulties with one another and Horace and, um, um, yeah, he was this hero and can't be on the other side. That's about it. I, you know, I would, I, I think a number of you said this. I think as much as he's, he may be a modern hero, to me, he does seem almost classically a tragic hero. I mean, someone mentioned Oedipus. And uh, I think that's really, it's, uh, that's why I was interested in your saying he was a modern hero, because to me, he seems... He seems ancient, actually. His his kind of um, his kind of despairing life almost seems uh, almost seems classical. Mitch, you I think someone said you may have had a question. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay. So this is a question for Barry that you probably have been asked a million times in your career, but. Um, one of the questions, and by the way, this has been an excellent discussion and I wanna thank everyone for participating. I, I've learned a lot. But I, I, especially towards the end, was thinking about <clears throat> uh, faith in God. God is uh, um, uh, um, omniscient, um, omnipotent, and yet we know what happens to Bucky. Wait a minute, you forgot one, Mitch. He's also all good, right? Beneficent. And he's all good. <laughs> yeah. And I know Harold Kushner <laughs> talked about this in his book, When, when Bad Things Happen to Good People. And I, I, in my mind, I was thinking about the conflict between random chance and the exigencies and vicissitudes of life versus a God that we, every Shabbat, we praise God as, as with the attributes that I just mentioned. Um, how, what is Roth saying about our belief in God? What, what is Roth, um, obviously Roth is saying that, and Bucky says this uh, when he gives his concept of God as being a fiend, I think he calls God a fiend and some other things. A, 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 right, a sick fuck. Yeah, I don't want to say right? that, but that's what he said. <laughs> and, and years ago, Barry, you said to me, uh, we can't believe God is a, a puppeteer, kind of like the Wizard of Oz model. That's the phrase you used. And I would just like to hear your view about faith at the same time, we're holding on to the concept of chance. And good things are going to happen to us and bad things are gonna to happen to us. And yet we're supposed to hang on to faith. What can faith give us? What's a realistic view of faith? 
Um, in, ten, in, in 30 seconds, please. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah Barry, uh, we've got four minutes, so just spin <laughs> that out quickly, please. Yeah, uh, uh, Mitch, I want to thank you for that opening. I've been, I've been waiting my whole career for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, um, I think one of the things that I have to, to say is that I don't think uh, we've done the kind of job that we need to be doing uh, within synagogue life uh, uh, and in, in and generally to speak about mystery. Um, chance. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, I, I, I'll leave it with mystery. Uh, I, I, I think, and this is um, I, one of the many things that I learned from my years of being involved with Catholic communities was the way in which the notion of mystery is so important uh, as they think about the faith. And I don't think uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, Mitch, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll be autobiographical here, um, if I might, um, because there's no time. I don't have only in three minutes. I don't have enough time. But I guess um, people, I, f I find people have been very, very tolerant of my, uh, my questioning throughout my entire rabbinic career. Some years back, uh, this maybe goes back six or eight years ago. Uh, Phyllis and I were with our very good friends from our years in Des Moines. And my friend, Marshall Flapp, and a retired orthopedic surgeon uh, said to me, so Barry, you spent about 25 years in congregational life and you spent 25 years on the college campus. Uh, uh, which, uh, which one felt more right for you? Uh, which one was more home? Um, and I said to, I, I looked up at Marshall and I said, uh, I guess I'd have to say uh, being on the college campus because I felt freer uh, to explore all of the uncertainties that I found in the books and in life um, and in a way in which often uh, it's a, more difficult to do uh, on, the, uh, on the pulpit. And Marshall looked up at me very fondly and said, oh, Barry, we knew. Um, and I, I've always appreciated um, that it that I at least tried to share my own uncertainties and my own questioning. Uh, I find that this Roth book, um, as I said, uh, I, 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 maybe it is a stretch to find hope within it. Um, I, I will say that uh, for the high holidays this coming fall, in preparation for the high holidays, I've invited a quite remarkable person to join me, uh, who's been my teacher in hope, um, to talk about uh, kind of the issue of hope uh, in our respective religious traditions. She's just retired from Augsburg, and we're going to do a couple conversations about uh, faith and hope uh, and what what it can teach us. Um, um, but uh, and and I think I'll have a, more of a chance, Mitch, then to respond to your very thoughtful and very important question. Thank you for it. So um, we, we, need to, uh, we need to close. I, I wanna thank every single one of you for joining us today um, and for valiantly going through Zoom um, uh, and tr trying this endeavor um, digitally. Thank you all. Um, Rabbi Citron, I, I want to turn it over to you to really close this and tell us about the next offering that you're that you're thinking about in this uh, pandemic series. A pandemic series. What a what a who could have ever who could have ever anticipated that we would do a a, a pan pandemic series. Um, yeah, I would say at the end of July, um, I, I I think. Uh, Anna, is, I think it's the 26th, the last Sunday around this same time. Um, I've invited Dr. Vic Sandler, who so many of us know, um, and Dr. Rachel McGarry, who's the curator of Prince at the MIA. Um, and we're going to talk, as, essentially, I think the way we have titled it is From the Black Death to COVID-19, Have We Evolved? Um, and 
which is to say we're going to be exploring from the standpoint of art history uh, and medicine and religious history. Um, the responses to the Black Death, which were very notable across the world, uh, and the responses to the COVID-19 and what we can learn from contrasting these two. Thank you so much, Rabbi. This was just a delight to be able to, uh, to share this meeting with you today. Uh, thanks for inviting all of us to join you for thinking you. of this fascinating book. Um,